Good afternoon. I'm Sal Cardan, the president of the Colburn School, and on behalf of our students, our faculty, staff, and board of directors, it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you to the second international symposium presented by the Zeering Conlon Initiative of the Colburn School. This weekend, we are so pleased uh, and honored to host so many distinguished scholars, critics, and musicians in performances, lectures, and conversation. And we're also so pleased to have so many of you here in attendance for this weekend. Originally inspired by the Recovered Voices program at the Los Angeles Opera, this marks the fourth year of the Zeering Conlon Initiative at the Colburn School, a program which has had profound impact on our campus community. I would like to thank and acknowledge the extraordinary generosity and commitment of our great friend and supporter, Marilyn Zeering, without whom this program would not be possible. I'd also like to acknowledge other wonderful supporters who are here uh, this afternoon, Walter Arlen and Howard Myers. And finally, I'd like to thank Maestro James Conlon for his amazing vision, tireless efforts in bringing this program to the school, and for his long-standing relationship with our institution and mentorship of our students. Thank you, James. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce the person who has also worked tirelessly to develop the program, and in particular, the symposium you're about to experience this weekend. Please welcome the director of the Recovered Voices Initiative at Colburn, Bob Elias. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I have a few uh, introductory comments to make. Uh, and I will do so in just a couple of moments. Uh, but first, um, uh, we have uh, someone who's not on the schedule, but who also uh, wanted to welcome everyone here today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, James Conlon. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I don't want to hog anybody else's time, but I couldn't stay away. Usually, today is a performance day for me. I usually don't do anything else before a performance. We have another Macbeth, um, another recovered voice here in Los Angeles. It hasn't been done in 28 years. I don't know how that happened, but it's back, it's recovered, and uh, I'm on tonight. So I will come to uh, part of the beginning uh, of the program, but I wanted to come out to welcome you all. Um, say uh, a big, big, big thank you to the Colburn School for their uh, brilliant and wonderful collaboration in making all of this possible for us um, to, uh, to bring the Searing Conlon Initiative, as it's so-called, um, into fruition, and we are in our third year. Uh, I want to make particular mention of uh, Marilyn Searing, who has been the guiding spirit, and we thank her, don't see her just yet, but uh, to thank you to Marilyn um, and for everything she's done at Los Angeles Opera of helping us to begin the Recovered Voices program and to extending that support here to the Colburn School and to this ongoing subject, which is so important to her and so important to many of us. So could we have an applause for Marilyn? <laughs> I would also like to, uh, to, to welcome very important, very important uh, supporters of ours, Howard Meyer and the remarkable Walter Arland, who are right here in front of us today. <laughs> and my own thanks to, uh, to uh, uh, Bob Elias for his tireless uh, missionary zeal with which he, uh, he takes care of this initiative, uh, works with the Colburn School and a thousand other things. Uh, to uh, and his devotion uh, to the cause of bringing back recovered voices. Recovered voices, as you know, as the term was coined at the LA Opera. Um, I prefer to entitle to music or degenerate music uh, because that was the term of the Nazis. It was not. It's not our term. I do not think we are. Um, we are a positive. We hope to be a positive force. We are recovering 
voices that have been covered, but we are hopefully helping to continue the long process of recovering them, uncovering them, and bringing them out to the public, uh, to the public space. Uh, I want to especially thank all of you uh, that have made long trips here, those of you that are going to be speaking, some of you that are just coming to listen. Uh, welcome. I hope you uh, enjoy the f first two days. I'll be here for some of it today, then I'm going off to get myself ready for tonight's Macbeth. Uh, but I will be back all day tomorrow. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, James, and, um, and thank you, Sel Cardan. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, as you have been welcomed to the second Zeering Conlon Initiative for Recovered Voices International Symposium. It's great to see you all here. Uh, and uh, again, I'm Bob Elias. Many of you have been getting emails from me. Uh, and I do serve as the director of the Zeering Conlon Initiative here at Colburn. This symposium, by the way, is just one of the activities that take place <clears throat> under the auspices of the initiative. We held our first symposium uh, in August of 2014, and I know that many of you here today were with us in 2014, and we're pleased to have you here again today. Last fall, we organized our first Recovered Voices Young Artist competition. That first competition was geared towards singers under the age of 30, and all competitors had to submit video performances of songs by Recovered Voices composers that were selected by James Conlon. Six finalists from throughout the United States and Canada were selected by a panel of six judges, and they performed additional songs and competed for cash prizes before a different panel of American and European judges and the public in Zipper Hall on December 6th again with James Conlon presiding over the event. Next fall, we will organize another Young Artist competition, and this time we will focus on instrumental chamber music. And each spring semester, including the one that begins this January, we offer a full 15-week, 30-hour course on Recovered Voices on Monday evenings right here in this hall. A number of you here today have taken this course already, and uh, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have taken the course? Very nice, thank you. Um, all of you who are here or who registered for yourself and possibly someone else, you will all be notified in about six weeks or so when registration opens for the spring 2017 course. I will write to you. Uh, and that would be in case you'd like to join James Conlon and me and some others for that journey as well. And uh, before we go any further, I do need to mention the thing about cell phones. Kindly do keep them silenced uh, whenever in the hall this weekend. All of our speakers and performers, thank you. Uh, you should all have a copy of the symposium program book that you will have picked up at the registration desk. Uh, and you will see that it contains a detailed schedule abstracts of each presentation uh, and uh, the program for this evening's concert that will feature mezzo-soprano Miriam Frank, pianist uh, Tali Todmore, and three marvelous musicians from Colburn Conservatory of Music. You will also find brief bios for each of our participants, and because we did include them in the book, uh, we will keep our verbal introductions of each presenter quite short. This way, more time will be available to our presenters and for the question answer sessions that will follow each presentation. We do have a, a very packed schedule for the next two days. And speaking of introductions and Q&A, uh, these moderator duties will be split uh, throughout the weekend between myself and Professor Michael Beckerman, whose advice and invaluable input at every stage of planning has been deeply appreciated. I can assure you that by the time we conclude our symposium around five o'clock tomorrow, you will have gotten to know Mike Beckerman and his probing and occasionally prodding approach to this topic. Um, and we will all be richer for the experience. We started thinking about this symposium many months ago and Mike suggested, 
and James concurred that we do something a little different this time. Different not only from the first one we did, which focused on the topic of censorship, but also different from most other such events. Our weekend will be a, different, uh, a bit different in a few key ways. Uh, and this is first encountered in the symposium overview, which uh, all of you should have seen, but is also reprinted on the uh, first page of the program book. And in that, we make clear that our purpose this weekend is to ask a lot of questions and that the answers may be incomplete or still works in progress or even contradictory, and that's okay. Also, this will be a three-way conversation between and among scholars, performing artists, and audiences. And because we also include presenters, that is people who organize or curate concerts rather than perform in them, uh, we can say it's really a four-way conversation. Oh, and also presenting are two of America's finest music journalists and critics, so let's call it a five-way conversation. You will also note that we have not just one, but four distinguished conductors speaking this weekend. You'll just have to trust me, this is very unusual and very special, and we're delighted. Another way this event is a bit different is that we also invited speakers who work a bit outside the specific realm of Recovered Voices. Musicologist Christopher Haley has written, quote, Music is texture, and texture loves a glancing light, unquote. We learn not just through intense direct engagement with a topic, but also through insights that illuminate the topic from adjacent frames of reference. For instance, we will hear from a pianist and concert organizer who is also a music therapist, from Istanbul, no less, who will briefly discuss Terezin composers from the perspective of a musician, music therapist, and as someone who has introduced these composers to a completely new audience. And because there is almost always someone who very reasonably asks, yes, but what about what was happening during the 1930s and 40s under Stalin and the Soviet Union? Though that is slightly outside the recovered voices focus. Well, because we always do get that question, uh, we will have a presentation this weekend on one of the giants of 20th century Russian music, and this will be delivered by a pianist conductor scholar whose family name is itself firmly linked to the struggle for artistic freedom in the Soviet Union. And we will also have a presentation by one of the world's foremost authorities on the topic of musical cultural property that was looted by the Nazi regime. And she will bring us into her remarkable world of object biography, and she will talk to us about how the physical context can often be as revealing as the musical one. And further to the question of, to coin a phrase, why is this symposium different from all other symposia? I would add one other note. <clears throat> Typically at an academic symposium or conference such as this, the emphasis tends to be on the who, what, when, and where of a topic. And we will certainly have our share of such information this weekend. What makes this event a bit different is that we will also be spending a great deal of time on the how and why and even whether. And so we begin. And our first session today, a panel, will be moderated by Professor Michael Beckerman of NYU, one of the preeminent scholars of recovered voices, composers, and their music. He is also widely recognized as a major scholar of Czech music of the 19th and 20th centuries, and his work has been duly celebrated in that country as well as in this country resulting in many awards, including uh, recently an honorary doctorate from Palatsky University in the Czech Republic. He has written on a wide variety of topics, 
And this year, Professor Beckerman also serves as the Leonard Bernstein Scholar in Residence for the New York Philharmonic. With Mike Beckerman in our opening panel are UCLA professors Tamara Levitz and Neil Stolberg. And Mike will more properly introduce them in just a moment. The title of our opening panel is Recovering the Recovered Voices of Yesterday and Today, a Dialogue. Mike, Tamara, Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, well, when we came in, we saw the chair set up like this. We realized we were going to be doing it in talk show format. So uh, aside from the formality of reading this introduction, we, we may read some things, but we, as they say in the talk show world, like to keep it real. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to Let me introduce uh, my dialogue companions, my talk show guests. Uh, uh, Tamara Levitz is professor of music and comparative literature at UCLA. She's one of the uh, leading American musicologists. Her book, Persephone, Modernist Mysteries, won the coveted Superbi Award from the American Musicological Society. She's also the editor and author of Stravinsky and His World, uh, and was the scholar in residence Her first book is te Teaching New Classicality, the Sony's Masterclass in Composition. She's written articles on Igor the Angelino, uh, an experimental music and revolution in Cuba, and many other things. She's now writing an article on white supremacism in relation to the founding of the American Musicological Society, and is starting a new book on music and imperialism, which seeks to, again, in her words, revise the history of modern music to ground it in the perspective of imperial politics. To my left is Neil Stolberg. He's conducted many of the world's leading orchestras, including Philadelphia, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Atlanta, Houston, St. Louis, and the San Francisco Symphony, the Netherlands Radio Symphony, and West German Radio Orchestra, Hong Kong Philharmonic, St. Petersburg Symphony Orchestra, and the Moscow Chamber Orchestra. He's appeared as opera and ballet conductor Is that better? Okay. Uh, I'll start from the beginning. Tamara Levitz is no. Um, uh, he has appeared as an opera and ballet conductor with uh, New York City, San Francisco, Netherlands Ballets, Long Beach Opera, Norwegian National Ballet, and Holland's Deep uh, Opera Company. His performances of the Mozart concertos conducted from the keyboard are uniformly praised for their virtuosity. Uh, for West German Radio, he's recording recorded orchestral and solo piano works of Lazar Siminski, Alexander Veprich, Mikhail Gnesin, and other composers from the so-called Petersburg, St. Petersburg School of Jewish Composers. A formerly assistant conductor of the LA Phil under Carlo Maria Giolini and music director of the New Mexico Symphony Orchestra. He's recipient of the Seaver National Endowment for the Arts Conductors Award, America's most coveted conducting prize. Uh, a native of Detroit, Mr. Stolberg is a graduate of Harvard College, the University of Michigan, the Juilliard School, and the Accademia Nazionale di Santa Cecilia in Rome. Professor and Director of Orchestral Studies at UCLA, he currently serves as UCLA Music Department Chair and Co-Director of the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. Please give them both a warm welcome. So I'll do what no good talk show host does. I'll start with some comments of my own. Uh, but to set some of this up, uh, I'd like to recall that many years ago, maybe more than 10, uh, maybe even more than that, uh, James Conlon, after we'd been together at some event at the 92nd Street Y, I think it was talking about Schulhoff, uh, asked me if I would come down to Florida to Miami where he was conducting and working and various programs for a program, music of the kind of recovered voices. And at that time, I, I, I think I told him that I wasn't sure I was interested. You know, I'd 
some music on the Holocaust stuff. It, you know, I heard about that all the time as a kid, and it was going to be depressing. And I, I, we'd be sitting there with our hands folded and sort of in memorializing. And, 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 and James Conlon said, no, 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 it's not like that. It's, I have a completely different idea about how this all works. And he explained to me that, that his, his idea was not to sit uh, you know, with hands folded uh, in, in prayer, but to, to bring back music that had been lost, to give composers who hadn't had a chance to make their careers or, or be part of the process of creating their own legacy a chance to bring this new music to the public. And, and he was true to his word, and, and the atmosphere was, was startling and exciting, and it was quite wonderful. Uh, and I was really delighted I, I'd come. And he also told me that he hadn't, he hadn't asked me down there because I was Jewish. He'd, he'd asked me down because I, I knew, supposedly knew something about Czech composers, and there were a lot of those involved in this. So I was feeling pretty good. But then um, I got a call from a cellist named Jan Fogler, Jan Fogler, who uh, he said uh, when I picked up the phone, um, hey, I've just recorded the Dvorak Cello Concerto with the New York Philharmonic, and I just want to tell you that I played it differently because I read your book. So naturally, as an insecure musicologist, my first thought was, oh, so now it's my fault. Uh, <laughs> but I, I was flattered as well. But even more than that, I, I began to wonder, and, and we began to speak about this, so how is it that you read a book and then you touch your instrument differently? What, what's that process of, of what does knowledge do? How do you change it? We, we started talking about these kinds of things. And one of the pieces that had been played in, in Miami uh, at that festival was a, a trio by Gideon Klein, which you'll, you'll hear tonight. <coughs> and uh, there's a, a marvelous cello solo right in the middle of the middle. Uh, and it's kind of overmarked. And, and w without telling Jan Fogler anything about it, I showed him the cello solo, and I said, well, what do you think? And he looked at it, and looked at it, and looked at it, and he said, you know, it looks as if somebody is being choked and is trying to scream. Um, and so from that time on, I started thinking about, first of all, what scholars and performers had to learn from each other about this music, because I learned an enormous amount from that comment. Uh, in, in a way that I don't think I could have learned just studying it on my own, but somebody who'd really thought about the cello and, and what it meant to mark certain kinds of things. And so for the next years, I, I did a, a whole bunch of experiments all over the place, in the, in the Czech Republic, in Germany, it, it, Juilliard, and uh, all over. And, and they usually were something like, um, well, for example, um, Smetna's second quartet was written when the composer was well, certifiable. He had gone insane. Um, so I, I began playing games. What happens when performers know about that? What happens when they don't know about that? How does the story of the piece influence interpretation? And then I did it with some of this terrazine repertoire, and I would do various kinds of sort of soft core experiments. I don't think it was you know, at the highest level of basic science, but where I would give uh, a group a score but tell them nothing about it and ask them to prepare it. And then maybe over a couple of weeks, feed them a bunch of different stories about it and then keep recording it to see the effect of these things. And, and the most striking example of this was in Dresden when it was performed in a church. Uh, and, and of course, with an aisle in the middle, uh, it was easy to give half the audience program notes and the other half got no program notes. And this was the Klein Trio, which you'll hear tonight. And almost to a person, the people who got no program notes thought it was sort of a sweet, folksy piece. And the people who'd got program notes thought it was one of the great tragic utterances of the century. So I began thinking, how is it possible that these stories, uh, which may be in some ways arbitrary, they can even be made up, they can be manipulative, and yet they have such an extraordinary effect on the way we all process things. So I wanted to have some kind of a discussion during this time between performers and scholars and audiences to play through these things. Because clearly, one side of it is these backstories can, at, at best, are 
you know, nebulous, problematic. They can interfere with any proper apprehension of the music. They read things in that aren't there. It's like going and listening to Mozart and deciding that the slow movement represents his feelings at the death of his mother or that Beethoven had gout and wrote such and such a passage and we should do away with it to other kinds of views that this is an essential part of history, that some composers writing during this time really did try to use sound to communicate their personal experiences and some notion of music as music shouldn't get between us and that. So there were all kinds of perspectives we, we hope will touch on all of them. And I'd like to mention one more thing quickly before I turn it over to, to my companions. And that's something that keeps occurring to me that we are in a strange and extraordinary period, maybe that's not the right word, in, in our own country. Um, this has got to be the most bizarre election season uh, that most of us have been through and it doesn't show signs of slowing down. Um, issues about race in this country have come up in so many ways, even in the last month or two, uh, with, with all the shootings and the discussions about them. And so even as we ask about the past, and we ask who were they, who were the perpetrators, who, who were the victims, how do we understand them, who do we identify with, I thought it was also important to ask, or at least raise from the beginning, the question of who are we? Uh, who, who are we? And, uh, you know, we point at people in the past who should have known things but did nothing about them. What should we know? What should we have known? And what did we do nothing about? Even as we look to the past, uh, that we want to try to find out things, but one thing I think and it's maybe just uh, my view, that we can never afford uh, as we investigate is uh, moral superiority. At any rate, I'd like to turn it over first to Tamara Levitz for some responses and comments, and then to Neil. Thank you very much to end with moral superiority. I wanted to say first that I'm very honored to speak to this public. I know there's many people in the audience who have spent a great deal of their life devoted to Jewish memory and Jewish music, so I'm very aware of that, and I'm honored that I'm the comments I'm about to make. In thinking about what Mike just said, I was thinking actually about power relations. And I'm gonna use the example of, I just came back from a conference in Vilnius, Lithuania, where there was, it was a conference on essence and context. And the point of the conference was to bring together philosophers and musicologists to decide about whether music can be in itself, music, the music itself. Is there such a thing as the music itself? Can we ever separate it from the meanings? I think Mike's very great interest. And I'm gonna use this for a few minutes now to give examples of what I'm thinking about with power. So first, it was interesting to see that philosophers for about 100 years have been trying to define the essence of music. What would be music only music? And they've had an extremely hard time doing this. First of all, because there's always a listener, there's always a creator, and there's always a performance in time, which means an event in history. And so it was fascinating at this conference to realize, looking over the history, that philosophers have had such a dilemma with this. In fact, the dilemma, there may not be something like the music itself, or at least it's very difficult to prove philosophically, there is such a thing. And one thing that struck me at this conference was that music accrues meaning through history. It's repeated, a performance, and especially in the recovered voices, bringing back a performance will give new meaning and that piece will carry it forward. All the times it's performed, it, it gains new meaning. And that led me to think about power. Who is deciding when it gets performed and who is deciding which meaning will be the one that will be broadcast? That was like, when you were, Making your comments, I was thinking about that. Who tells the performers or who, which, which meaning will be the one promoted in the world or the one that will become dominant? To give the example of Lithuania again, when I was there, I was very interested to find out about a conflict of memory going on there. This may be very familiar to some of you. In 1991, when Lithuania, around the time it became independent, they made the decision that there were two genocides in Lithuania. There was the genocide of the Soviets killing the Lithuanian citizens, and there was the genocide of the Jews. And this has led to a very fraught situation where there are two 
ways of remembering. There are two cultures of memory. There is a memory of the Soviets killing the Lithuanians, and there is a memory that is pushed more aside of the Jews, the genocide of the Jews. As some of you may know, they built a museum in Vilnius, the Museum of Genocide, and it is not about Jews. It is about the Soviet killings of Lithuanians. This is, of course, controversial. Um, and they also built, a, they have a second museum for Jewish history, but it doesn't get the same funding and it doesn't have the same central place in, the, in, in Lithuanian society. I tell you this story because last year Ruta Vinigete and Efrain Zernoff published a book which talked about how Lithuanians participated in the killing of Jews, something that is not recognized in Lithuania. There's a strong idea that it was the Nazis who killed the Jews, not the Lithuanians. And why I tell you about this, it started a big debate about which memory we want, which genocide is the genocide. Do the genocides get equal treatment? Are they both genocides? And I think about this because I was thinking about conflicts of memory or memorial cultures, the recovered voices and maybe other um, traditions of memorializing around them. Um, another example that I wanted to just uh, give, uh, thinking about power and who gets to decide which memory or which, what national memory will be Lithuanian national memory and what happens when there's several versions of that memory. On the same trip, I went into Belarus to see where my grandfather was from. And it was interesting going into Belarus because that's a place that has not been particularly keen on its Jewish memory maybe, but also where many other countries have been working towards establishing Jewish memory. So you will go into a town in Belarus and you will see really horrifying ruins of Jewish life, which no one has really paid attention to, but there will often be a memorial plaque because there has been an Israeli group or a British group or a US group or a European Union. Someone has come and put a plaque. And it gave me a second example of memorial cultures. When, when people, there are people who want that remembered. There's a European Union commission right now to create a Jewish heritage trail through Belarus, but there's a lot of resistance. So that's an example of incredible political conflict over memory. Now, we're not talking about the today, but I thought the, uh, that whole experience of being in Lithuania and seeing all the conflicts of memory while we were talking about the music itself and trying to determine it led me to think about this. And the last point I wanted to make on that, and it's another fraught point, one thing I think about is when one does have power, when one's sitting on a stage and speaking or when one has power as a professor, does one think about how does one use one's power to do good in the world? And thinking about... Uh, let's say we're going to have at UCLA in the winter um, a symposium on civil rights and the black Jewish uh, collaborations with Prince and Kurt Weill. Um, I was thinking about maybe one thing that happens is in, today in the United States, Jews also, they have a history of victimhood, but they are also, since the 40s, participating in and profiting from white privilege. And this is something that historians like David Rudiger and others have analyzed in great detail. When did Jews start to be able to participate in whiteness and profit or be, uh, the, uh, gain from the advantages of, of having white privilege? And thinking about that, the position of being Jewish with white privilege but also with a, a history of, of a genocide, I wonder about thinking how recovered voices can dialogue and how, how just as Mike just said, how do we with recovered voices or in thinking, and I, I won't use that because I'm not involved in the recovered voices directly, but how do we in thinking of Jewish history think about black history, think about Hispanic history, think about many women, you were talking about the election and women just got bashed on, um, yesterday. So there's very many histories. And so I think what I come to is when thinking about all the meanings is a consciousness of the power one has and a consciousness of how one thinks about other cultures of memory and the dialogue between them and, and, and then also about a civil rights that goes across very many groups. I guess that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with my friends and colleagues, uh, Tamara and, and Michael, and with all of you. Um, Michael shared uh, a version of... of his remarks uh, a few days ago, and I, and I took the opportunity to make a few notes about them, um, which I'll use as the basis for what I'd like to, uh, to say now. I represent, of course, on this panel, uh, the performer's perspective. Um, the performer being, let's call it, the retail part of the transaction. Um, so I'd like to make some comments from that 
from that standpoint. Uh, Michael, I think the question that you're raising, and it's a, one that comes up for performers all the time, is how, how do we integrate the backstories, the context of a work as we understand it into the performance decisions that we make? Those of us who perform have all been through having our views of a work changed, even shaken, by direct experience. This could be uh, personal contact with a composer or with a performer who has had a very close relationship to a given composer. Could be an encounter with um, a newly discovered manuscript or other source material related to the piece. It could be experiencing non-classical music from a country or a region from which a work originates. Could be learning more deeply about the rhythms or cadences of a text's language in music that has text. Could be experiencing a work in the physical space for which it may have been conceived. Or seeing a musical work through the lens of another art form. And as I was thinking about it, I've been fortunate to have many experiences like this, those that are very, um, very vivid to me. Um, I think, for example, about a, a chilly gray day in November a few years ago when I was given a tour outside the town of Gurlitz on the Polish-German border of the exact spot in the prison camp where uh, Messiaen's Quartet for the End of Time was first performed. And in fact, every year at the date on which uh, that performance took place, which was a January, um, it gets performed outdoors in that, in that spot. Um, another example I thought of was uh, j just making a sort of pilgrimage myself to the three places uh, that, uh, all three of the three places that Charles Ives uh, depicted in his work, Three Places in New England. Um, or an indelible experience for me of having the very first notes that I ever conducted in Russia being the opening unison string melody of the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto in a rehearsal with the St. Petersburg Symphony on the stage of the St. Petersburg, the large hall of the St. Petersburg Philharmonia. Starting at the top, you know. Uh, how can a powerful experience like that not affect one's approach uh, to making performance choices? But ultimately, of course, the performer's job is to evaluate all the evidence that they can find, both inside and outside of the score, and then make their decisions, ultimately trying to produce the most affecting, convincing performance possible. Uh, obviously, there's no music, no anything, really, without context. Um, and I think your examples are, are very fitting, Michael, about that. You know. The identical French meal that you eat in a restaurant in Los Angeles is going to taste quite different in a chateau in the French countryside. And the more context you know, the more tools you have as a performer, so the better off, the better off you are. So context, context and backstory should always matter. But alone, they obviously aren't enough to carry a performance. The musical decisions that a performer makes ultimately also involve bringing the performer's accumulated musical culture, values, experience to that task, and somehow harmonizing them with one's knowledge about the work itself. Um, very much like the uh, experiment that you, that you mentioned, uh, an exercise that I often find useful for myself, and which I often recommend to students, is to 
as you said, to actually mentally try to remove um, all identifying information from a score. Who wrote it? When it was written? What period was in? Uh, what influenced it? Um, just notes on a page, you know? It's a, it's a pop song now. Um, what do your musical instincts tell you about it? Um, now, that, that might sound paradoxical, but I found that that approach, a historical, non-contextual as it may be, can also be helpful in uh, uh, thinking about performance choices. Performer has to find every way they can into a score. Question that I'd love to explore, and again, which you, which you touched on, um, particularly with the performers among us here, is what happens when instincts and values clash with knowledge. Uh, the mind and one's research dictate one pacing or articulation or uh, grammatical or syntactical understanding of the music, while the ear and the heart may compel another approach. To me, that's when things get quite interesting, and, and I look forward to uh, further discussion about that. Uh, finally, I'd just like to make a quick comment about the choices a performer needs to make when they present unfamiliar music, like the Recovered Voices repertoire, to the public. Because I know this will come up also later in the conference. Um, presumably, a performer has chosen to perform one of these works, first and foremost, because of its inherent musical value. Although there could be exceptions when the performance is in a context, let's say, of a wider examination of a composer's work or a period or a subject, like in a festival type setting. But as performers, we've chosen to specially advocate for a neglected work, so naturally we want to provide some reasons to the public for why they should be interested in a piece they've never encountered before. Of course, the best reason and the best evidence will always be an impassioned and convincing performance. But the slippery slope here, uh, as, uh, as I sense from some of Michael's comments and as I sense we may be hearing later on this weekend, is if the performer seeks in some way to manipulate in advance the listener's reactions by overselling a compelling backstory, or worse, uh, distorting or sensationalizing or sentimentalizing it. Uh, when that happens, the picture is often not so pretty. Good. <clears throat> well, um, you know, we've raised, all of us, this uh, somewhat of a dichotomy, uh, which we're not going to solve here, uh, about the, this notion of m words like musicality, the music itself, on the one hand, and then music in the world among its stories. And, and Tamara raised the question of whether that can even exist. Um, but it's almost, uh, one thinks almost of a kind of creepy science fiction. I, I remember I was interviewing uh, von Dochnani, who was going to be conducting the New World Symphony. And so I was trying to, you know, typical musicologist. I was sort of trying to fill him up with some of the stories about the New World Symphony and connections to the Song of Hiawatha. And he listened very patiently and politely and said, yes, I like to hear all that stuff and then I like to forget it. Um, OK, so you, if you're a musicologist, you have to live with that. That was, that was fine. At least he heard it. Uh, but I mean, it, does music really exist simultaneously in two dimensions? One dimension that is this kind of, and, and in terms of the way we as audiences perceive it as well, uh, on one level, it is the, you know, sort of sounds in musical space interacting in various ways, the impassioned performance. And then we have these stories, and I don't think we even know exactly the effect and how it all works when they get together. And another question is, um, I, I came to some of these issues because my father was a stage director, and he directed a lot of Shakespeare, and I quickly realized that there were at least two Shakespeare's. There was one who lived in the English department, who was a text and could be interpreted in hundreds of different ways, 
to the point that you could say there was, no, there was no one Hamlet. There were only multiple Hamlets, shards and scores of Hamlets. Uh, but then there was this thing in the theater department where Shakespeare also lived as a creature of the theater. And while it was fine for the English professor to say there's no such thing as a single Hamlet, we have to keep the ambiguity. The question is, if you're a director trying to put on Hamlet, uh, can you really, what, is, what good does ambiguity do you necessarily? You have to decide on one of those Hamlets and create it. So, so there, I won't say that there's a natural antagonism between performers and scholars, far from it. There's a lot of collaboration, but the enterprises are, are vastly different. Uh, and I'll, I'll just mention one more thing that sort of brought it home to me. There was an event at Bard College where we were working with a string quartet and um, one of the people who was involved from Bard uh, had a, had a mic microphone like this, and all the musicians were dressed in black, and it was supposed to be a dialogue, but the scholar actually had the microphone. And essentially, the, the performers were mute. So talking about power relationships, you know, and, and, how, and how those are controlled, and, and whether there's a disparity of sorts because the natural language of the scholar is blah, blah. I mean, we, we speak, we talk, we use words. Um, you know, not only sometimes don't we let performers speak, but we don't always recognize that, that the way they approach things is quite different. You know, a friend of mine used to say, look, you know, you, you are looking for intellectual things, but when I'm playing a string quartet and I catch the other player's eye and we do something, that's also intellectual. It's just a different kind of thing. So again, uh, all these kinds of communications between scholars and performers, I think, uh, if, if not fraught, are filled with all kinds of misunderstandings and, and tensions, some of which are productive and, and some not. More comments? I would just say I wonder um, if really the scholar and the performer are different types of human beings. And what I mean by that is, um, I was reading something this morning by Edward Said on, on, on amateurs, and I was thinking about, you know, the, the in, we are all approaching music from our own place, and so the person who speaks the words or the per person on the violin, are we really ontologically different in what we're doing? And I was thinking also about this because each listener may... They, there are so many stories we may bring with us to the music, and your story may appeal to a story I heard when I was five years old. So I'm just wondering if we have to divide so strictly between the people who allegedly have the intelligence or intellect or whatever it's called, and the and the people who allegedly have the aesthetic connection, or do we all have variations on that? Sure. Hopefully, we're all enriching each other that way, and we we try to do that with all of our students, of course. Um, but as I think as Michael says, um, at the end of the day, from a performance perspective, um, you are, uh, as a performer, you are a manipulator of, of time and sound, and, uh, and you're, you are a rhetorician. You're trying to convince. And in order to convince, you have to be convinced. Uh, and, and there's not so much room that way for, for ambiguity, although, uh, in my experience, there are, there are musicians who fall into two camps in this area. One, one, a musician who comes to conclusions, who feels that those conclusions are, uh, uh, you know, what, 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 um, supports the most compelling performance and, and, and sticks with those conclusions until such time as maybe they, they change that idea. And another kind of musician who prefers the spontaneity of, uh, of coming out every night and doing things quite differently from, from the day before. Um, you know, usually the first, first musician would say to the second one, well, can't you make up your mind? You know, what's the matter with you? Uh, but, but it's just, it's two different aesthetic approaches to performing. 
I, I would say, I guess, that anyone who speaks about music has the same choices. Like, you may notice, an, or, and I'm not using the word in, in intellectual or scholar, but rather anyone who approaches music, you have the same choices. Once you get on the stage, you can't say, I'm going to tell you 5,000 interpretations of this piece. You have to pick one. So it, it sounds like a similar process. Yeah, but it's also a question of, of what you need to know. I remember once uh, Lynn Harrell was pl about to play the Dvorak Cello Concerto at the San Francisco Symphony. I had given a pre-concert talk, and the guy who was director of education saw Lynn Harrell coming towards me, and he said, oh, Mike, I want you to meet Lynn. And he said, this is Mike. But he said, Mike, Mike, tell him all your new theories about the concerto. And I could see his eyes pleading with me, Lynn Harrell, do not tell me anything. I'm about to go and perform this thing. The last thing I want to hear is anything that's going to change my idea, like right before. Now, if, you'd, if we'd spoken two weeks ago, maybe. So you know, I, I think there is a, a kind of certainty that you have to have um, that I, I, I think you know, scholars have certain kinds of certainty as well. But I, I think that the, the, the concept of ambiguity is different. But I wanted to, to raise a, a, the last thing, really, which is we've spoken a bit now about what performers might need to know and, and the power relations, perhaps, between scholars and performers. And, but, but what about audiences? Uh, what, what do audiences need to know? What, what changes a performance? What kind of knowledge is, is, is the right amount? Uh, one of, uh, one of my colleagues uh, has sort of railed against uh, the program note culture where you know, people will sit at the symphony with uh, their noses buried uh, in, in a program or if it's a song recital, uh, they're so intent on the text they, they don't watch the stage. Um, so you know, you know, we have a sense that there's no such thing as too much knowledge, but um, is it distracting? Uh, do, do we provide too many backstories? How relentlessly honest do we need to be about the veracity of the stories we, we talk about? Um, how, how can we know? Obviously, we, you know, our readers for program notes and such things aren't going to insist on footnotes on our footnotes on our footnotes to, to show the documentary truth of it. And yet, I, I would just say the average footnote, I mean, the average program note is 50% made up out of whole cloth. Uh, and, and so to, is that still important to have? So I mean, I, I, I'd like to get some comments here, but also because we do want to encourage from the beginning, even in brief, um, some discussion with, with our audience. Um, if any of you have comments about any of these issues, about what kinds of information you like to get, or, or times where it's just been too distracting to get certain kinds of information about a piece, or whether you've ever felt manipulated by the kind of information that you're getting. Does, I wonder if anybody has any comments? Yes, please. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I, um, I'm a pianist. And I just play show music, and I play a lot of Kurt Weill. And uh, my, main, f my main idea is to come through to my people that are sitting here and listening to me. So I have to have my heart with it. And so every time, <clears throat> and also one thing I do on purpose, I never had my sheet music with me. So that whenever I sit at the piano, I have something new to do. And that way, I <clears throat> have a, feel a contact with the people that are in front of me. And so uh, that makes it, I don't know, it's, to me, I have, I have a conversation and I think most musicians need a conversation with their audience. And that's very important. And very often, the, all the notes, all the, all the things written and such, okay, it might be here, but when it comes to performing, it's not there anymore because it's you. Uh, more comments from our audience now that I've uh, climbed all the way up? This is. I feel like Letterman or something. Who's, who's, did I see a hand? Oh, here, sorry. Please. Well, the climb was nice. Hi, uh, this is really very interesting, and it's wonderful to see you again. Um, I have actually one question and just one comment. The, the question is for Neil. 
and it's what do you need to tell the orchestra before they start playing? What do they expect from you? And then the second is, it seems to me that the less known the work, the more you need the context. So if, it, and it's not really that it's less known, it's, it's less known because the period's less known. So if you're listening to a recovered voice, you know that period, so maybe you don't need as much. But if you're listening to something that was uh, composed last week, you might need more context and help. So that's just a thought. I'm sure all the conductors here will agree that orchestras, in, as a general matter, prefer things shown rather than spoken about. But having said that, uh, it's, it's been my experience at least that, um, as you say, when, uh, when a work has a context that you feel as a conductor, it would be useful very useful for the orchestra to know about. Um, by all means, you know, I start with a few words, a few, you know, sentences of explanation or uh, perhaps handing out certain things to the group. Um, not just text, but maybe some other explanatory information. So uh, I think people appreciate that just like an audience appreciates it, uh, in, in my experience. Um, as long as it, you know, as, as long as you, you gauge your room carefully and, uh, and don't abuse that privilege, so to speak, that privilege. Um, and I agree with you also that um, speaking, you know, before a concert, speaking from the stage, as again, all of my conductor colleagues here do so skillfully also, um, can really be very illuminating under the proper circumstances. You know, the, the one rule I've always heard is don't talk longer than the piece lasts. <laughs> right, unless it's Weber. No, even if it, then you have to play it twice. Um, but, um, but, you know, some, the, the, the well-chosen well -chosen words, I think, are usually appreciated. I just want to say one thing. That was a beautiful comment about performing vile, so thank you for that and thank you for the question. I just want to say I feel still that in our world today, the way we're listening, there's so much information flowing about music. Musicologists are a little tiny piece, teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, many people who listen to all kinds of music are getting information on the web from their friends, from their parents, from their... And so I again think about uh, when we decide which information to communicate, we're taking a role, we're, we're, we're taking power, we're deciding which story to tell. Because I, I just imagine that the information, let's say they get the program note, they, you can also go on your phone just before the concert and find out more about the piece or find out the kind of information you like. So I feel like in today's world, there's such an information flow and our, that's why I wanted to bring it back to which information do we decide to tell people about this piece, or when we decide it's a recovered, it is a recovered voice, but we decide to frame it that way. Well, again, this brings us to the, you know, question that keeps being asked about action and reflection. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess crudely, the Yogi Berra, you can't think and hit at the same time principle, uh, which is even whether or not you get information and what kind, uh, to, to what extent can you bring it to bear to the listening experience? What effect does it have on the listening experience and who says? Um, and is, it, is, it, is the kind of, uh, well, even the, the idealistic notion of complete engagement with the work, uh, does that put us in, in a state where we're it, you know, in every way, not only psychologically, but neurologically in terms of the way our brain works, we're incapable at those moments of, of actually accessing any of that information, no matter what it is. Uh, or, and do we understand um, even, I, I suppose, the neurology of anticipation, where, where you would read something about a work, uh, and that would set you up in a certain way and even though you couldn't, couldn't access that while you're listening, you've somehow primed yourself in a way for a certain kind of engagement. Yes, please. Thanks. From a neurologic standpoint, the sound goes through the ear very quickly 
and much, much faster than information from speech. And I've often wondered if the actual development of music preceded complex speech. Now, the genius of the composer is to get that emotion right in. The genius of the performer is to modulate that to help uh, amplify that. And when you write a story, then you modulate that even further. But how much of the story do you need to really get that original emotion in? Tamaros cautioned us about perhaps making too much of a separation between, say, the performer and the scholar. And I, I understand that. But I'm sort of curious, since um, you've articulated one of the primary ways people address our response to music, uh, which is using the word emotion. And I think that's also a key when it comes to, well, accusations of manipulating responses. But um, are, are emotions real things? And, and do we really believe that you know, human experience is again a, a, a Mr. Spock-like intellect on the one hand and emotions on the other hand? Um, don't, don't we believe that human experience, and in particular our, our musical experience, uh, is, is so integrated that it's really impossible to separate these out? Um, and and, I, and do, do we risk, is, is maybe some of the risk that's come up when we talk about this repertoire uh, is repository in the idea of emotions, that there's some sort of visceral appeal to sentiment and emotion which actually um, destabilizes our fullest apprehension uh, of, of music and sound, which is the synthesis of the experience, uh, not one at the expense of the other. But I, I, again, I, I go back to, and, and Tamara raised it as well, this question of abstract sound versus sound that is anchored in world experience, whether we call that emotion or stories or, or actions. And, and again, I, I don't want to create a hermetic or a long-winded view of the past, but you know, I, I keep in my own imagination going back to those moments in Amsterdam after the Spanish had been kicked out by the Calvinists all these, organists are, all these organs are available, but they're not to be used for church services. So these musicians like Svelink and several others get together, decide to have something called a town concert, which essentially hadn't really existed before. And then they have to figure out what kind of sound do you make when it's not to be danced to, it doesn't have a text, it's not a march, it's not anything, it's sound to be listened to. Uh, it's different. And then at the same time in Italy, you know, you, you have sort of the rise of opera where people are thinking of ways of using long-term and, uh, long and short-term dissonance to create effects that are associated with drama. And it seems that from the very beginning, these two impulses are tied together and inseparable. And yet, there are those who periodically try to pursue one path or the other. Uh, and we can always point to the fact that they come together. So, you know, is that the danger that we're worried about uh, with this kind of music, that either it will be too antiseptic and, and be completely divorced from any context it might have, uh, on the one hand, on the other, that it'll be so steeped in that context that there can't be any broader apprehension. Um, yes. That's a great comment. I, I wanted to say to that, that um, you know, one of the very first people who, who to talk in music, college, or music history about the music itself was Edward Hanslick in the 1860s. And the big battle back then was over whether emotions are in the music or not. Are emotions from the people listening or are they actually somehow in the music? And it's, there's been a lot of studies of this, like how emotions can be, is there an analogy in the music? Does music just have the same movement as emotions? And why I bring this up is, again, sorry I'm always breaking down binarisms, but maybe emotions are also to think of them as not mystic, we just don't feel happy, but that they are also analyzable and also narratives and also stories in the world we bring to music. So again, I'm trying to think of uh, if we, and that leads me to think, with the recovered voices or what this worry of being manipulated that are we conscious of the emotions being raised are we conscious of the emo again being able to intellectually understand emotions and not only put them in a mystic space apart from our intellectual thought mm -hmm. yeah. Come on. you know the the what's i think prior to 
consideration of all of these questions in the case of repertoire like the Recovered Voices repertoire, obviously, is just the opportunity to hear it, you know, uh, which is something new for so many of us uh, over the past decades. Um, so uh, it's great in a way that we've come to the point where we can start thinking about that as a repertory that we're familiar with enough so that we can begin to discuss these kinds of these kinds of questions. The only other thing that I would say, and it just maybe it's in re reaction to a few of the comments, uh, emotion and intellect and all, I guess it's just the comment that was attributed once to Toscanini when he was asked what his kind of artistic credo was. I don't know, maybe that's another story that's not true, but I kind of like it. <laughs> he just said, uh, greater expression, clearer form clearer form. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just saying with the idea of whether emotion is inherent in the piece. One of the things that, and I'm going to bring in now the music critics, one of the things that you read often as very harsh criticism, which of course I always agree with, is that um, there's too much Puccini in opera today. <laughs> Puccini was great when Puccini was alive, but P Puccini died and should not be resurrected in every new piece that's performed. And I think that's because the Puccini that's emotional and serves him so well in his operas doesn't serve today's composer as well, that it's not inherent to the piece. And I think that the recovered voice period, it was in fact a very emotional period even if they had not been in the Holocaust, they were already in a pretty emotional period and that it's inherent in their pieces and therefore appropriate to be put out in words as well as the music. It's, it, does that make any sense? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, and, and the, the question of, um, of times and emotion though is complex because one could say, no matter how horrible a situation is or was, could it have been any more horrible than Beethoven's brain? Uh, you know, in other words, I mean, the man was in such torment, so if we're looking for emotion, anyway, let me get Walter. Yeah. Yes, my question is to Ms. Levitz. Uh, you say you uh, are interested in Stravinsky and undoubtedly know a lot about Stravinsky. Tell Tell me about emotion in music as far as Stravinsky is concerned. Of course, that's a wonderful question because Stravinsky, as many people in the room know, famously said that music would not express emotions. He's often been misunderstood for that. And Stravinsky is coming right out of this debate of the 19th century about emotions in music. And I think what Stravinsky felt extremely sensitive about is that people would link the emotions back to the composer. That's another part of the pathway that I think there's a lot of controversy about. Is it the composer just feels the emotion, writes the piece, the emotions in the piece, and the listener gets it? Is it all that easy? And Stravinsky, I think, truly believed in emotions in music, but he wanted, he did believe that there was a history of those emotions being constructed. For example, in his time, people understood some of the emotions in Mozart and what they meant, so he could use what people already understood in his audience. He understood that there had been a historical construction of the meaning of emotions. That's how I understand Stravinsky. So he's a, a brilliant example of someone who cared so much about this, but also was, was cautious because he was an emigre I think in France about everyone linking it back to him and saying this is what Stravinsky did. I did also want to say I loved your comment about were they very emotional back then because I think there are cultures of emotion and I do think that what you just said Puccini in our present are we in a time when we need that particular culture of Luca in 1880 or are we not in that time anymore so I love that comment as well but that's what I would say. Uh, that's, that's it for our session. I'd like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank our audience. Thank you. And uh, on with the show. <laughs>